First, I would like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation. Uh, sorry for the delay, but I was convinced that my talk was at 4.30, so I just found out a few minutes ago that it was now. <laughs> um, so, uh, as you can see, I'm going to talk about testing in the context of cyber-physical systems. And uh, when I came here uh, on, uh, what is it, Tuesday morning, I think, and I went to breakfast in the hotel, uh, it was kind of a funny coincidence that I came across a very strange cyber-physical system that I'd never seen before. Uh, all the people staying in the hotel have probably seen it. You know, a robot to make omelets and uh, sunny side up eggs. I'd never seen this before. Uh, and, you know, being the geek that I am, uh, you know, there was a chef actually making eggs and omelet next to the robot, but I went for the robot. Uh, you know, and I selected sunny side up eggs. And what I got was this. <laughs> Including numerous pieces of shell mixed with the eggs. <laughs> so I thought, all right, I'm working on testing cyber physical systems. Uh, so there are two possibilities here. Either we don't have the same requirements, that is the same definition of what sunny side up eggs are, and whether or not shells should be included, you know. Or there is a testing problem, that is the system hasn't been tested with different sizes of eggs or different thickness of the shell, uh, but one or the other, you know. So, you know, I thought it was a quite, a, quite a funny uh, coincidence. Uh, before I, uh, I get into uh, the talk, uh, let me tell you where I come from so that you maybe better understand uh, what I'm going to present. I work for a center called the SNT. It's an acronym that stands for Security and Trust, uh, whose objective is to perform collaborative research with uh, industry. And uh, we are where we perform fundamental research, applied research, and we have uh, R&D projects in collaboration with our partners. We usually uh, contribute problems and domain knowledge. And uh, so we try to cover the entire spectrum going from long-term basic research all the way to uh, technology transfer. And the, uh, how would I say, the philosophy that we work, uh, that we comply with is that even basic research in engineering disciplines needs to be informed by best engineering practice. That somehow, uh, even basic research in our field should be driven by a careful understanding of engineering practice in various domains. And so we have uh, our scientists who share their time between those different activities. Uh, we are now about 300 employees. Uh, we have 40-something industry partners at this stage, uh, 51 nationalities. We are located in that very small European country called Luxembourg, stuck between France, Belgium, and Germany. And uh, more than 50% of the residents of the country, I guess it's a bit the same thing as in Singapore, are actually uh, foreigners. <coughs> we are located in two different places, uh, downtown, where you have all the financial and European institutions, and uh, near the French border where the government built uh, a new uh, campus uh, for the university. And uh, we are hiring as well. <laughs> so uh, if you are interested, send me an email. Uh, I am uh, managing a department called Software Verification and Validation, where we cover a number of activities in software engineering from requirements engineering to security analysis to automated testing and runtime monitoring. Uh, we uh, work with a number of industry partners in the automotive, satellite, and financial domains, mostly. Uh, and uh, all our research is driven, basically, by industrial problems defined in collaboration with uh, our partners. And the way we work and you will see examples of that in the projects I'm going to present, is that we define critical problems in collaboration with our partners. 
usually those problems are too large to be addressed at once. So we decompose those problems into sub-problems. We re-express them in scientific, uh, in the scientific form. And those problems become our research objectives. Uh, we look usually at the gap between the scientific literature and the industrial problem. And usually that gap in software engineering is very large. There is on, on almost every topic uh, a significant gap. And that's why we try to focus on, you know, filling that gap. And then we go through a number of steps of uh, validation in an artificial context to get at least a, a first idea at low cost of whether or not our solution is going to work. And eventually we move on uh, to pilot projects with our partners where we do more realistic and more expensive uh, validation and we iterate and refine the solution. So that's how we work. Uh, now this talk is going to focus on a very specific topic, automated software testing and more particularly how artificial intelligence plays a role in automated software testing. Uh, we, I will restrict uh, my presentation to cyber physical systems because as you will see, they have very specific characteristics and the solutions that are required for testing such systems often look quite different from uh, other types of systems. I will only provide a partial overview. This is not going to be a conference talk. I'm going to give you an overview and give you just enough details so that I can draw conclusions, interesting conclusions, about the entire body of work. I will give you example of industrial research projects and try also, as I was asked by the organizers, to provide some insights in terms of uh, how we run those projects with industry and what the challenges are, what are the benefits. So I will also try to address that at the end of the talk. So let me first give you an introduction because many of you may not be very acquainted with uh, software testing or even some aspects of AI. So this is a definition of software testing. So software testing involves or entails the execution of a software component or a system in order to evaluate properties of interest, such as whether or not they comply with requirements, uh, whether they always uh, respond correctly to all kinds of inputs, and uh, whether they perform their functions within acceptable resources in terms of performance or memory usage or whatever, response time. So usually uh, in software testing, there are a number of activities that are important and that need to be automated. Uh, ideally, you need to derive test cases in some systematic way. This can be based, for example, on the system specifications or other sources of information. Uh, from the same source, ideally, you want also to derive what should be expected results or what should be properties that the system should comply with uh, in order to decide whether a test case passes or fails. And this is called the Oracle problem. Uh, test cases should, of course, be uh, automatically executed. And then uh, outputs are compared against the test Oracle in order to determine whether the test case fails or passes. So usually at a high level to simplify, this is what testing looks like. Of course, in practice, automating those activities is not easy. And how to do it varies a great deal depending on context, the type of system you are dealing with, for example. The main challenge of testing in practice is scalability, is how to be able to effectively automate testing uh, when it is applied to large or complex artifacts, meaning input spaces, code, models, if models are used to specify the system, and still provide useful support within acceptable uh, resources. Uh, and uh, the reason why I'm going to focus on automation today is that automation is a prerequisite for scalability. It's not sufficient, but it's a prerequisite. If, if those activities are not automated here, uh, there is no scalability. You can't uh, possibly. Uh. So of course, in practice, uh, a lot of companies and a lot of engineers 
for example, manually analyze test outputs. But uh, that is the test oracle is a human being, but that's not a, a scalable solution. So you might say, OK, well, you know, maybe uh, software testing, uh, who cares? Uh, why? Why should we care about this? Uh, the fact of the matter is that even though there are other verification techniques, for a number of reasons, software testing is by far the most prevalent verification technique in practice. And it represents a large percentage of software development costs. Above 50% is not rare. Uh, it's, uh, testing services are a market of 9 billion US dollars. The cost of software failure has been estimated in 2016 to $1.1 trillion. And the main source, according to a study which is uh, published here, the main source of problems is inadequate tools and technologies for testing, according to that 2016 study. And that's exactly what I'm going to uh, talk about uh, today, is how to address that problem. So cyber-physical systems, which is the focus today, uh, are specific in the way they interact with the physical world. Uh, first, because they interact with the physical world, they are often very critical or safety critical. And also their interactions, as you will see, are extremely, can be extremely complex. And the physical world itself is extremely complex, making testing difficult. Also, as you will see, another problem is uh, that testing with uh, the physical world in the loop is ex extremely expensive. So specific techniques have to be uh, developed to enable uh, test automation. And this is the, the definition of cyber physical systems. The cyber physical systems, even though, uh, you know, with now with the, uh, the popularity of companies like Google and Amazon, you know, uh, you may not realize it, but actually cyber physical systems represent a very large uh, proportion of software development in industry. I mean, basically, uh, embedded software is everywhere on many, many devices. <coughs> also, one thing which is very specific is that cyber physical system is developed in a specific way. What I have here on the slide is, of course, uh, a slight overgeneralization or a, a slight simplification. But, you know, I need to somehow uh, do that if I want to tell you about how those systems are developed. In general, there are three stages. The first one is called the model in the loop stage. And here, everything is what is called a function model. That is, the physical environment is modeled, the control and decision algorithms are modeled using typically executable languages like MATLAB Simulink. So here, everything is a model in the first stage. Uh, the models can be continuous or discrete. Eventually, if you want to generate code, the models have to be discrete. But usually, initially, they are continuous. So we are talking about differential equations and stuff like that. Eventually, you have the software in the loop stage, where, of course, the practice is varying from company to company, where people here start talking about system architecture, software architecture, uh, using, for example, modeling languages like CSML or other things. And uh, the code also is generated, or partly generated, should I say. Uh, and some type of analysis are performed that couldn't be performed before, uh, such as, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, trying to predict uh, the software performance and stuff like that, or analyzing your traceability or performing uh, change impact analysis when there are changes to requirements. Uh, and the last uh, phase is hardware in the loop, where here the software is actually deployed on its target platform, and you have real hardware or analog simulators in the loop. So the reason why uh, the software is developed that way is that in the first phase here, model in the loop, the advantage is that you can really test at a relatively low cost 
all the control algorithm and all the decision algorithm. Make sure those algorithms are correct. And uh, you can run a lot of test cases because uh, you have no hardware in the loop. The environment, is, you know, everything is modeled. So you can do that. Uh, and it's very important that you uh, uh, find all problems in those algorithms before you move on to uh, the next uh, stages. In the software in the loop stage, uh, you, the actual software is executing. It's not a model anymore. But the environment is still simulated. And of course, in the last stage, uh, it's the real thing. In the last stage with hardware in the loop, testing is extremely expensive. You can only run a very limited number of test cases. And so, of course, the question is which ones? Because you know, it's so expensive and so limited that usually people have time constraints. They, they can only uh, do some limited amount of testing. All right. So what I'll do is that I'll give you examples across those three phases, actual example from actual collaborative projects with industry. So uh, during meal and seal testing, testing is computationally ex expensive. So there is no manual intervention. Nobody has to set up the hardware. But the computations are quite uh, significant. Why? Because we simulate the physical environment. And this is extremely expensive from a computational standpoint. Uh, in HEAL, the problem is more the human effort that is involved in, in testing. Uh, but in general, as compared to other systems like web systems or other type of system, testing, the number of test execution is necessarily limited. Either because of you know, uh, expensive computation or because of uh, human intervention. And the problem is that the test input space is extremely large. So on one hand, we cannot execute too many test cases. And on the other hand, the, <laughs> the test input space is large because it's determined by the complexity of the physical environment. And as you will see in some example I will show, uh, that physical environment is usually quite uh, complex. I mean, it's very different from the, uh, you know, uh, the robot making eggs. You know, it's, it's quite significantly different. Yeah. Ah, OK. And another thing uh, is that those systems often are uh, safety critical, as I've said, because they interact with the physical environment. Uh, and therefore, usually standards require that there is traceability between system test cases and requirements. And that traceability has to be documented and is usually uh, verified uh, during uh, you know, the certification of the system. And this is also complicated because uh, you have hundreds of requirements, thousands of test cases, I mean, you know, and those requirements are changing. So that traceability is, uh, is a challenge. Yes? Uh, sorry? Uh, yeah, we, we try to, you know, yeah, we need to automate the, the Oracle. I'll show you how. Yes, we need to. Uh, otherwise, uh, we have a scalability uh, problem. But the simulation, might not be We will see, we'll see examples. Um, so, I told you we were going to focus on the application of artificial intelligence to test automation. And by artificial intelligence, as you know, it's, uh, it's a phrase that doesn't mean much of anything. Uh, I mean meta heuristic search, machine learning, and natural language processing. Those are the three types of techniques I will uh, illustrate here in this talk. So, just uh, very briefly, for those who are not uh, acquainted, meta heuristic search is a set of techniques that performs what's called stochastic optimization. So it's not exact optimization, but it's stochastic optimization. A uh, very uh, well-known uh, type of techniques in that category are uh, you know, evolutionary computing. And uh, a very well-known specific technique in that category is genetic algorithms. However, you have hundreds of such uh, search algorithms. Uh, and uh, the goal is to uh, efficiently explore, not in an exhaustive manner, but efficiently explore uh, a search space in order to find uh, near optimal feasible solutions. We don't always need optimal solutions, but we need near optimal solutions in many engineering problems and in software testing. It, uh, depending on the algorithm you use, it can address discrete or continuous domain optimization problems. And more importantly, 
something which is very important, and that's why uh, very often we cannot use uh, a traditional mathematical optimization based on gradient descent or, or convex optimization techniques, is that we cannot compute any gradient because very often we don't have a closed form formula of the thing we are trying to optimize. Uh, so, for example, as you will see, uh, you can you will you are only able to uh, compute fitness often by simulating something. So there is no way. Uh, to do uh, anything else but some form of black box optimization. And that's what those algorithms are uh, good at. And as you will see, this is applicable in many practical situations, including software testing. However, of course, as the name indicates, heuristic, those techniques provide no guarantees. But very often, we don't really care in the context of uh, test automation. So there is a field, a subfield of software testing, a scientific field with a conference every year and all that, and a few hundred people, uh, hundreds of people in, uh, uh, all over the world working on this, called search-based software testing, where the testing problem is re-expressed as a search optimization problem. So imagine uh, the trivial case where you have a, a one-dimensional input domain, and you are looking for a particular input that has a particular property. So for example, to cover a particular statement in source code. And you are looking for uh, inputs that achieve that objective. But the input space is very large, and by doing random search, you are unlikely to find it. And that's why uh, you use meta heuristic search. Uh, and uh, very often, the landscape, the fitness landscape looks like this, where you have a lot of local optima. You know, the fitness landscape is typically very complicated. So uh, you can use something like a genetic algorithm where you evolve a population in order to find a particular uh, optimum. So uh, you probably know about genetic algorithms. I'm just presenting that briefly because I'll be using it uh, in one of the projects I'm going to present. So you know that this is emulating uh, natural evolution. So it's doing optimization by evolving a population of solutions. In our case, it would be a population of test cases or test inputs, for example. And uh, it performs operations like natural selections of the fetus individuals, reproduction of the fetus individuals, mutation of those individuals, and it iterates over many generations in order to achieve uh, a near optimal uh, solution. That is a, a solution that maximizes or minimizes fitness depending on the problem. Machine learning, this is the second thing we'll be using. As you know what machine learning is, it's very popular nowadays. So there are a lot of papers in the literature where machine learning is used for test planning, test case management, such as prioritization, test case design, uh, and debugging. So in our case, uh, we will focus more on what is called here test case design. You know, uh, we'll only limit the discussion to that particular aspect. But just know that there is in the literature, there are a lot of applications of machine learning to testing that go beyond uh, test case uh, design. Natural language processing, which is a third type of technique I will be uh, using. You also know what that is. And why is that important? Is because in practice, natural language is very prevalent in uh, software development, especially in the context of cyber physical systems where uh, Standards require that you write explicitly requirements, that you trace requirements to architectural decisions, to system test cases. Though you have a lot of documentation. And that documentation, even though you know, it's based uh, partly on models, it's also very much uh, you know, expressed as natural language. You know. So the idea is then is that you know, well, well, can we use that to help automate testing, to help derive test cases, including oracles? from textual requirements or specifications. And importantly, you know, I told you about traceability, help establish traceability between requirements and system test cases in some automated fashion. Instead of having people do what I've seen very often, have huge Excel sheets with test cases and requirements, you know, <laughs> and crosses in the middle, <laughs> which is absolutely horrible, you know. Uh, People go mad doing those things, you know. Uh, so, uh, 
Can we uh, do something about that? So I'll show you in one case how we did it. So now let me go through some project examples. I picked uh, particular examples, but of course I, I could speak for two days on this uh, if, I, if, if I wanted to. <laughs> uh, so let me go through those examples. The first one is about testing advanced driving assistance systems with one of our partners, IE, that I'll be using as an example here. So you know what those uh, advanced driving assistance systems are. Uh, probably you have some of them on your car. Automated emergency braking system is an example. Uh, pedestrian protection is another one. It tries to detect pedestrians and brake. Or traffic sign recognition. This is the only one I have left active on my car. I turned off all the other ones because I don't trust them. You know. But this one is harmless because it just tells you uh, what the speed limitation is. Or, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's correct or not. <laughs> uh, so, um, what do they look like? Well, you know, this is a, an abstract diagram that tells you what they look like. You have the car, you have a lot of sensors that tells you, I don't know, the speed of the car, the acceleration of the car, and other things. You have actuators like the, the brake or the throttle, the acceleration throttle. Uh, you have also uh, sensors and cameras that monitor the environment, such as radar sensors or, or cameras that also analyze uh, what is in the field of view of the car, whether there is a pedestrian, stuff like that, using, uh, you know, convolutional neural networks, CNNs, and uh, stuff like that. And the ADAS is the part here where you have basically uh, control algorithms and decision algorithms that decide whether to brake, whether to uh, accelerate, or other things. And this is what I'm going to talk about, how to test those. But I'm only going to focus here on uh, meal testing, model in the loop testing, okay, in, in this example. So that means here the ADAS and the environment are simulink models in this case, okay? So the problem with the testing such system is that the environments are highly varied, as you can imagine, the number of possible combinations in terms of road topology, weather conditions, buildings on the side of the road, pedestrians, and you know, and there are a huge number of possible scenarios which are determined by the trajectories, possible trajectories of pedestrians and cars and their speed. And, uh, and the, but the problem is that those uh, systems play increasingly a critical role in modern vehicles, uh, which is actually uh, amazing because it's actually, it's actually impossible to demonstrate that they are safe or safer than human beings. But that's what is happening. Uh, and they must comply with functional safety standards, such as the well-known ISO 26262. And actually, I really don't know how you can comply with those. Those systems can actually comply with such standards. It remains a mystery to me, but uh, somehow, you know, they have to convince authorities. <laughs> so it's a challenge for testing, among other things. You know, uh, they are now trying to develop another standard which is specific to those systems. It's called SOTIF, but it's not finished yet. They are defining it. Um, and also, there is a general uh, fundamental shift that will not surprise you, is that before we used to develop control systems by specifying them and writing code. That's what we used to do. And now more and more, you have components for which you have no specifications and no code. You only have a neural network. I mean, it's basically the control has been learned from data. So uh, you're using some form of deep learning. So you don't have any source code. You don't have any specification. You only have uh, weights in a neural network. So this is a bit of a problem for traditional verification and testing, which is, has always been based on either specification or source code analysis. You know. So what do you do with this? So of course, there is work that exists that has been published in the last couple of years where people try to define a, adequacy coverage criteria or mutation testing for uh, deep neural networks. But, uh, you know, there are a number of uh, limitations and, and this doesn't address system testing. It's more like component testing. Yeah. All right. Uh, so what we want to do is to try to develop something that helps 
with that respect. Uh, help engineers efficiently and ex effectively explore the complex te text input space. Identify critical failures. And also characterize the input conditions that lead to critical situations. This is very important for people to understand whether they can deploy the system or not. Such systems always have limitations. They are never going to work in all conditions. You know, if the fog is uh, terrible and the light is very low and, uh, you know, and the pedestrian is just coming, uh, you know, all of a sudden in front of the car, you know, <laughs> there's nothing you can do. So uh, you will always find input conditions under which a system fails. But the question is not uh, whether it fails or not. The question is whether it's acceptable. Yeah, that's the question. <coughs> so I'll use uh, an, ex an example. For example, uh, the uh, automated emergency braking system. So here, typically, you have a radar sensor that captures object positions and speed. And then when something is detected, this information is sent to a camera, the software on a camera, uh, usually uh, you, which is using uh, neural networks to determine whether it's a pedestrian or not. And depending on the likelihood of that object being a pedestrian, a decision is made to break. And depending on the distance, uh, the force of the braking is also determined and stuff like that. Uh, so here, what would be any critical situation is pretty obvious, is hitting a pedestrian at high speed. Because, uh, you know, the consequences are kind of uh, serious. <laughs> uh, but as you will see here, uh, there is a, a subtlety in the definition. Uh, is that the system properly detects a pedestrian in front of the car with a high degree of certainty. That is, here we are not testing the software and the camera that determine whether or not it's a pedestrian. We are testing the ADAS system. So it's given that there is a high probability that the object is a pedestrian do we avoid that critical situation? OK? So of course, you could test the system in different ways. You can do on-road testing, as we know. Google and others are, are doing that. But of course, it cannot be the only way you test those systems. <laughs> you, know, you cannot test them for the first time on the car. You know, obviously, there are a number of issues with that. Even though you know, Google, Google has infinite resources, you know, but still, you know. Uh, so very often, those systems uh, are tested first based on simulation. And you have an, uh, this is a screenshot of a, a, a tool owned by Siemens called uh, Prescan, where you can define different scenarios in terms of the trajectories and speed of pedestrian cars, uh, the topology of the road, the weather conditions, and stuff like that. And you can actually simulate what is going to be perceived by the sensors and the camera. So for the ADAS, there is no difference, or very little difference, between the actual physical scenario and uh, the simulation. And that's usually uh, the way you try to first uh, test the system. So that's why we are in the context of meal testing, as I've said. So uh, you have the ADAS system, which is a system under test, a MATLAB simulic model, because this is, as I said, meal testing. We have the simulator of the physical environment that simulates all those things. Sometimes what is called the physical plant. It's a strange term. In our case, a vehicle, sensors, actuators, the other cars, a pedestrian in the environment. The test inputs is basically a particular scenario in terms of the weather conditions, the trajectories of the pedestrian and cars, and their speed. And the test outputs uh, shows where things are at, at every timestamp, and whether or not at some point there is a collision or a near collision. <coughs> you know. So well, let's skip that. So of course, as you can imagine, uh, the test input space here is extremely large and complex. You know, I was telling you before that that's usually the problem with cyber physical systems, is that uh, a lot of different scenarios and different conditions can happen. You're not going to do any form of uh, exhaustive testing. You're not even close to that. Uh, and also, explaining failures is not easy. Why is a test case failing? What, what conditions lead to such failure? Failure meaning the violation of a safety condition, like the one I've mentioned before. 
And something also which is very particular to that type of uh, testing is that the physics-based simulation uh, is extremely expensive from a computational standpoint. So it's not like testing a web system, you know. I mean, it's each test case execution is a, a significant endeavor. <laughs> okay. So here, the first example of using AI or some of the techniques I've mentioned before uh, to help with test automation. Here we're going to use two things: a simple machine learning technique, or you know, that you have heard about probably, uh, decision tree classification models, combined with multi-objective search algorithms, an algorithm called NSGA2, which is based on a genetic algorithm. But the only th difference is that it doesn't have one fitness function. It, has, it can deal with multiple fitness functions, up to three, four. Yeah. So in our case, why do we need to use multi-objective search? Because we want to uh, maximize or minimize, depending, three objective functions. Uh, the minimum distance between the pedestrian and the field of view of the car. We want to try to bring, uh, in the scenario, the pedestrian as close as possible to the field of view. Uh, the car speed at time of collision, we want to maximize it if there is collision. And the probability that the object detected is a pedestrian, the probability you know, the, that the camera recognizes it as a pedestrian. Because if it doesn't, then, it's not, uh, then there is nothing you can do. Uh, and of course, the problem here is that to compute this here, those objective functions, as you can tell, we need to run the simulation. We have no other way to compute this. That's why it's expensive. So when you do uh, multi-objective search algorithms, what you try to do is to find uh, solutions, in our case, test scenarios, on a so-called Pareto front. You know what Pareto front optimization is. But in case you don't know, uh, you are trying to find non-dominated solutions uh, assuming you have two fitness functions, F1 and F2 here. We have three in our case, but I'm not going to draw in three dimensions. So uh, may, assuming you try to maximize two fitness functions, you're trying to find solutions that are not dominated by any other solution. Solutions that are as close as possible to the real Pareto front that you don't know. Okay? And you want a technique that is effective at guiding the search towards solutions that Pareto front. But also, and this is important in our case and in general, a solution that maintains solution diversity on the Pareto front. Because we are doing testing. We don't want to test the same scenario again and again. Or we don't want to test similar scenario. We want to test the diversity of scenario on the Pareto front. And that's exactly what NSGA2 does. It actually achieves those two objectives. Okay? I won't go into the details because that's not the goal here, but uh, that's what that algorithm does. So how do we apply it? Uh, in input, we have the input data ranges and dependencies and the simulator and the fitness functions that I've mentioned before. Uh, we use NSJ2 to select the best test cases and generate new tests using genetic algorithm, using uh, evolution. We evaluate the, test in, the, new test in, the new test cases by running the simulation and we compute the fitness functions. And we iterate uh, until we achieve our objective using uh, the traditional genetic algorithm uh, process. And what we hope to get is the worst case possible scenarios in terms of violating our safety properties or being as close to as possible to violating the safety properties. Because even if you don't violate them but you are very close, it's worth knowing because you may want some kind of safety margin. You, know, you may not want to take chances. Uh, so how does it work intuitively for those who are not very familiar with genetic algorithm? You generate in some clever way an initial population of test inputs, which are the little circles here. Uh, you, oh, oh, what happened here? I don't know what happened with the colors. What is this? Anyway, you uh, compute the fitness. The larger the circle, the larger the fitness. You select in some randomized way uh, the fittest individuals, you breed them, you generate new blue circles, which are new test inputs, and you keep going until you violate the property or until you realize that fitness doesn't has reached a plateau. Okay, and you stop. That's how it works. 
But the problem is that, as I told you, uh, test execution is very expensive. So we need better guidance to decrease the number of simulations to achieve our objective. And that's where machine learning comes in. So you know what decision trees are, but for those who don't know, it's a simple machine learning technique. We have used machine learning in some more complex ways, but I don't have time to talk about that here. So I decided to use a simple example. Decision trees is just a way to partition, to partition uh, an input space into homogeneous uh, regions. Okay? So uh, in a stepwise manner, uh, the input space is uh, decomposed into hyper rectangles because you, know, you, have more, you have a number of dimensions. Uh, so that as you decompose, uh, you get more and more uh, homogeneous regions. In our case, homogeneous in terms of the proportion of uh, safety violations or not safety viola no safety violation. So for example here, if the road topology in this is in a certain way, uh, the angle of the trajectory of the pedestrian is in a certain way, the speed of the car is above a certain value, uh, we have a 69% chance of uh, being in critical uh, situation. So this is the example in our context, but it's a general uh, technique to identify uh, homogeneous uh, regions in, uh, in an input space. Uh, normally, this is used for prediction, uh, but we are going to use it in a different way, as you will see. So how do we use it? We start with the same step at an intuitive level. We do fitness computation. And here, we, we build a decision tree, and we identify homogeneous regions, which are represented by rectangles here, because we have only two dimensions. And then we only uh, perform selection into uh, the regions that have a high proportion of uh, critical scenarios, because this is what we want to focus on. And we perform breeding within those regions. And we are going to iterate, as you will see. And little by little, we are going to characterize the conditions under which you have a high likelihood of violating safety properties, step by step. We're going to refine the decision trees. So then the process is somewhat changed. Here you build, a, you know, it's like before, except that there is a change here. We build a classification tree, we select generate test in the fittest regions, and we apply genetic operators in only in those regions. And little by little, we are going to build generation after generation more and more refined decision trees, characterizing in an increasingly precise manner uh, conditions that lead to safety violations. That's how we use the decision trees. Uh, and we compared uh, the, our algorithm with uh, NSGA2 by itself. And we have demonstrated that it outperforms it in terms of optimization. And we have also uh, verified that uh, over time, the decision trees we build uh, are uh, characterized increasingly smaller, more homogeneous regions where you have a uh, violation of safety critical properties. So we verify that experimentally. All right. And we talked to the engineers. We went to the engineers, our partner, and we said, okay, we made them use the tool. And we tried to figure out how they perceived the tools useful to them and for what. So uh, first, they told us that uh, thanks to the decision trees, they could characterize more precisely the conditions under which safety violations were occurring. And this was useful for them to understand where the problems were. Then, but they told us also other things that were uh, a bit of a surprise to us. We, did, we didn't know that beforehand. Uh, that Often, uh, the reason why uh, the, you fail, those times fail, is that the hardware may have some limitations. For example, the camera may have a too narrow field of view. Uh, you know, I, you know, because you know, in the automotive industry, they always try to minimize the cost of hardware for obvious reasons. So they always try to uh, use the cheapest possible hardware. <laughs> you know, that's very important. You know, no hardware should go wasted. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you know, if you need a certain camera, you don't want a, you don't want a more expensive camera. It's very important. So, uh, 
But this allows them to understand, for example, that sometimes you fail because you, your camera is not good enough. And then they can go to management and say, well, we fail under those conditions. Now you have a choice. We stick to that camera or we get a better camera. What is it that you want to do? And, you know, and they, can, they, have a, they have some facts on which to base their arguments. You know. And also, it can be used for providing warnings to the driver while the system is being used. You know the condition under which your system doesn't perform well. So then you should tell the driver, ideally, you know, don't trust me. Turn me off. <laughs> you know, uh, that's uh, also useful. All right. And in fact, it's more complicated, but I don't have the time to go into those details. In practice, you don't only test uh, an ADAS by itself. You really, on a car, you have a set of ADAS systems that I call features here that read the same sensors and act on the same actuators. Okay? And somehow they have to work together. So you also have to do integration testing. Because at every time step, uh, all those systems send comments to the actuators. And then the system has to decide which one goes, <laughs> you know, which one has priority. Okay? Let's say you have a, a system that reads uh, road signs, and, other way, and, and, and also you have a cruise control system that tries to follow a car, a smart control system. Well, you know. You're not going to go above the speed limit just to follow the other car, you know. So you have to choose, uh, you know, what common acceleration throttle, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we have worked on how to do that type of integration testing uh, as well. Uh, once uh, ADAS system have been tested individually, you know. Okay, now let me go to something completely different where I'm going to give you an example of the use of natural language processing. I've shown you an, uh, some quick example where we use meta heuristic search, in particular genetic algorithms, and machine learning. Now I'm going to show you how, in one project, we used uh, natural language uh, processing. If it works. Yeah. So here, the context is a bit different. We're talking about much simpler system. We're talking about those typical embedded systems you have in the automotive industry, which are small but usually safety critical which means that they have to be certified. They have to be in terms of complying with uh, functional safety standards, like such as 26.26.2. So here is an example of a seat occupancy system. We try to determine that there is someone on the seat, and if that person is a, is a child, and if it's a child, you turn off the, the airbags, stuff like that. You know. So there are usually uh, systems that are not uh, very complex from, from a functional standpoint, but they have to be robust to hardware errors, and, they are, and you have to demonstrate that they are safe. You know. And requirements here have to be, uh, as required by the standard, they have to be defined in some way. And those requirements also often in that industry, they act as a contract. So then the, the customers will insist that you fulfill the requirements on which you agreed. So it's important to have the requirements right. The problem, of course, is that there are usually many requirements changes in the process, and which leads to constant, a constant negotiation process where you keep changing the requirements, you keep testing the requirements. You know, it never ends. Unfortunately, it's not a clean uh, process. So then somehow what we would like to do is to find an automated way of verifying compliance between such a system and the requirements. Because, as I said, it keeps changing all the time. And you have hardware in the loop, so you cannot run too many test cases. You, for those systems, you don't have a simulator. You don't simulate like in the, for ADAS. You're not going to, well, you're not going to simulate the, you know, the seats. Or, you know, it's not worth it. So uh, the testing for those systems usually happens on the actual uh, deployment platform with the actual hardware or some analog simulators. Uh, yeah, analog simulators. So here, what we're going to do in terms of solution is that you have requirements in that particular case, in that company, like it is often the case. It's a common practice. You have use cases, use case specifications. Uh, I assume that most of you know what use case specifications are, but it's a specific way of writing requirements in some form of natural, structured natural language. And you also have, a, so in that case, we, have also, we use also other form of inputs. Uh, we have uh, introduced a notion of domain modeling in their practice, because this was required for reasons I will mention domain modeling is uh, the exercise of identifying all the concepts in your domain and the relationships. Uh, 
So, uh, and uh, you have usually also a mapping table where you map logical operations to the driver's low level operations. Because eventually you want to generate uh, the test code, test driver. So we are going to use the natural language processing. Why? Because we have requirements in natural language, use case specifications. So if you want to automate this, we have no choice. We have to analyze this. You know? So here I'll be uh, using, in my example, that system about uh, seat occupancy. But it doesn't really matter. Use case specifications. There are many details about that, but I'm not going to talk about it. But here, we don't use any use case specification methodology. We use uh, a technique that I worked on. Oh, uh, a while ago with a PhD student, which is more restrictive, where you restrict the way you express use cases. And you have keywords that somehow uh, show the natural language processing software that a particular step, in a particular step, the system sends data to an actor, or an actor sends data to the system, or the system validates a condition in order to trigger another scenario. Uh, so for example, uh, this means that you check that no error has been detected. And if it has been detected, you stop executing that flow of events. You switch to an alternative uh, flow of event. So it's more restrictive. In fact, it's a trade-off, like often you have to do in software engineering if you want to have working solutions. On one hand, we want legible requirements that even customers can read. And on the other hand, we want use case specifications that can be analyzed by NLP without making too many mistakes. So we use that particular way of specifying use cases, our UCM, because basically it's exactly a trade-off between those two things. You are restricted, there are keywords, but it's legible with very little training. And uh, you can also check compliance with the methodology by using NLP. So you can tell people who are writing use case, use case specifications, oh, you are violating a rule of the methodology here. No, here you are wrong. This is incorrect. So we have a tool like that, you know, to allow people to f easily use uh, that methodology and easily define uh, use case uh, specifications. And you have a, usually a basic flow and an alternative flow. And whenever a condition is violated, like here, uh, you move on to a specific alternative flow. Okay. And as you can see, uh, those uh, use case specification use a lot of domain uh, concepts, such as airbag control unit, error, weight, stuff like that, okay? which are defined in the domain model. So the advantage is that once you have an ana analyzable use case speci specification like this, you can derive a test model that captures a control flow and the nature of the different steps, uh, whether it's uh, an input step, a condition step, an output step. You know. And then you can make testing systematic by making sure that every path in the control flow is executed. The only problem here, in terms of automation, is that you have conditions in natural language which are associated with each path. You know, here are examples of conditions in natural language. And this is not amen amenable to uh, constraint solving. It's natural language. Yes? Yes. Uh, I think it's probably a mistake. <laughs> yes, sorry for that. It's a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> it was a test to see if anybody was actually following. Uh, you know. So uh, the problem here is that we have conditions associated with those paths. And they are in natural language. So we, you know, we, are, we are doomed. What are we going to do with this? How do you do automation with this? You know. And that's exactly what I was trying to get at, <laughs> to show you an example of the use of NLP. Okay? So we have a domain model. Uh, we have uh, a constraint in natural language, like the system validated that. Uh, sorry, there is some automation here. I didn't mean to trigger. It's too late. Uh, the system validated that. No error has been detected. And somehow, uh, what we want is to express that in a form that is amenable to constraint solving. So here, uh, because we have a class diagram for the domain model, we use the object constraint language to express uh, the constraints. 
which is a standard constraint language in the context of the UML uh, language. So somehow we need to go from here to there so that we have a chance to be able to do constraint solving. So, and if we're able to do that, then we can generate test inputs. Uh, in our case, represented as instance diagram of the class of the domain model, the class diagram modeling the domain. Okay? Uh, but how do we go from here to here? This is very, usually very hard for engineers. They need support, otherwise they're not going to do it. One thing engineers, and even good engineers, like you have often in the automotive domain or the uh, aerospace domain, they are not very good at writing correct constraints. They can, they can read them, they can, you know, modify them, but if you tell them you have to write uh, 80 constraints, uh, it's not going to happen. So how can we autom automate that? Well, you know, that's where NLP comes in. So we built a tool called OCLGen that does exactly this. Uh, and uh, the way we did it is that first, one thing that made it possible is that we noticed that most of the constraints, because of their nature and their context, followed a certain pattern where you had, usually uh, you followed this, you, you, call it, you, you took all the instances of a particular concept in the domain model, like error, and for all of them, you check the condition where you have a left-hand side expression, which is a variable, or right-hand side expression, which is a variable or a value, and you have some kind of an operator. And the point, so we knew that the target of the translation from natural language to the constraint would be this. Then, we went through three steps. First, we determined the role of words in a sentence. So, uh, understand that, for example, this is an actor uh, which is affected by the verb in the sentence. This is a final state. Second, we match those words in the sentence with concepts in the domain model. And third, uh, we use specific verb, uh, verb specific transformation rules to go from the natural language, depending on the verb, to uh, the uh, constraint. And for that, we use first a technique called semantic role labeling, which is an advanced NLP technique that help you, helps you determine what is the role of words in a sentence. Then we use string similarity in order to understand uh, how the concepts in the sentence mapped the concepts in the domain model. And last, we use lexicons in order to determine the set of roles in a sentence that are usually associated with each type of verb. There are categories of verbs in lexicons to do that. So you see, all those are NLP techniques that are used in those three steps, different NLP techniques. And it worked pretty well. And when it didn't work, it was because people were inconsistent in their use of terminology. They were not consistent. And actually, we sh what we should have done is to check the requirements before using the technique. And we would have avoided uh, those problems. Uh, because there is a way to check consistency between the domain model and the requirements and, and point out inconsistencies. But so uh, basically, the result would have been perfect uh, if we had done that. And here, they are pretty good, but not perfect. You see, in that particular system, there were 88 constraints. You are, not, you are not going to get engineers to write 88 constraints. They're not going to do it. Or oh, they are going to have a lot of problems. So you need, they need help. <laughs> That's what we did. <coughs> OK, last example, completely different. And this is, applies to both seal and heal. It's about schedulability analysis and stress testing. So the context here was the oil industry, the offshore platform. And the, on those offshore platforms, you have a lot of control systems uh, to prevent gas, le gas leaks and uh, fire and stuff like that. And you have uh, drivers that are safety critical that control all the, all the sensors and actuators on the, on the offshore platform. And uh, those uh, basically uh, are uh, uh, concurrent tasks that execute and interact. And they have usually hard deadlines, as you can imagine. So uh, what do you do usually in the context of such a system? You know, common practice is to do schedulability analysis in order to determine if a bunch of, class, a bunch of tasks are schedulable, uh, in particular the critical ones. 
And, but usually it's not enough because schedulability analysis is, uh, is, based on many, uh, is based on assumptions and estimations. So eventually you need to do stress testing on the actual platform to make sure that there is no deadline misses. And stress testing is uh, typically uh, complex. First, because testing is expensive. You have hardware in the loop here. You know? uh, and finding stress cases is actually difficult. Finding the test cases that really stress a particular critical task is not an obvious uh, problem. Why? Because tasks uh, uh, interact. Some tasks trigger others. Some tasks pre uh, preempt others. So whether a task J1 meets its deadline depends on uh, when uh, another task with a higher priority, uh, J2, execute. So then the question is, what are the arrival times of events triggering those tasks that stress the most the system with respect to the deadline of a critical task? And so, again, this is a search problem. The search space is uh, uh, arrival times for all, for all those tasks. And the question is that you want to know what are the arrival times that, that is going to trigger a particular critical task with respect to a deadline. And uh, so we re-express that problem as the constraint optimization problem. And here you will see we use two things, uh, constraint programming and meta heuristic search, genetic algorithms again. And you will see why in a minute why we combine the two. <coughs> Uh, the advantage, basically, you, you probably have an idea, is that genetic algorithms are scalable, but uh, constraint programming offers guarantees if it can scale. So I, ideally, we'd like to benefit from both. Yeah. So the solution of a view is that we have a, a task architecture model. We use a, a profile of UML called Marte to capture all the information about the task, the priorities, and interdependencies. So we need some kind of a model that captures the task architecture. We need that information. Uh, then we use a, a mix of constraint programming. We use, we use at that time uh, CPLEX from IBM and genetic algorithms. And the goal is to find task arrival time that are likely to lead to deadline misses or that stress the, the system as much as possible in bringing the completion time as close as possible to the deadline misses. And why did we combine CP and GA? It's because we wanted to benefit from both techniques. So this is an abstract view, of course. But basically, we use GA to identify critical regions of the search space. And within those critical regions, we run constraint programming in order to get guarantees that within that neighborhood, there is no worse solution. So we combine the two somehow. And uh, it worked well. You know, we, uh, we benefit, basically, from the two techniques. You know, achieved nearly GA efficiency and CP effectiveness. We, did a, we ran a, an industrial case study on, on the system I've mentioned before. And of course, this can be used both during SEAL to do schedulability analysis, and then during HEAL for stress testing. Because you can also, of course, use that to do schedulability analysis based on estimations of execution times and stuff like that. And you can do it without making assumptions because it's just search. So there is no assumption as opposed to uh, theorems. <coughs> so there are other projects. I gave you some uh, example projects, but there are uh, others. Uh, with Delphi and QRA uh, in the automotive and aerospace, we worked on the mill testing and verification of uh, controllers. Uh, with uh, SCS, which is a satellite company, uh, we uh, worked on uh, hardware in the loop testing, acceptance testing of actually uh, uh, in orbit testing of a satellite. When the satellite is already deployed before it's put into operation, there is a last testing phase, which you can see as hardware in the loop testing, <laughs> uh, but it's in orbit where you try to test the satellite before you put it into operations. So the satellite is already launched. Uh, and I, if I have time, I'll, I'll briefly uh, tell you about this. We'll see. Uh, and other projects, very different. Uh, timing properties in embedded systems with AE again. And the Luxembourg government, uh, we actually uh, uh, tested their tax system. <laughs> so it's an example of uh, an information system that is 
uh, maybe not safety critical, but uh, business critical. You know. Uh, so, uh, and in all those cases, we use meta heuristic search. In some cases, we used uh, machine learning and you know similar things. So uh, here is a quick overview. What time is it? Okay, maybe very quickly. Uh, so in the context of Delphi and QRA, uh, basically we are talking about controllers. So we are not testing the uh, an ADAS system, we are testing controllers. Uh, and what is uh, specific with controllers is that their inputs are signals, their outputs are signals. So it's not just uh, a value, it's a set of values over time. And therefore, what we are looking at when we are testing, we are talking about properties of signals whether there are discontinuities in signal, whether there is instability, uh, how fast you go to a certain position, you know, stuff like that. So we're talking about dynamic properties. Okay? That's what is very specific to that type of testing. Uh, so <coughs> here, the input space is a space of possible input signals. So as you can imagine, uh, it's a big space. Huh? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> And usually, we have requirements in natural language. Uh, what we do is that we transform them in some form of logical uh, form. And then eventually, we define a fitness function to tell us how far we are from violating that logical requirement. And of course, people need help in going through those three steps somehow. I won't talk too much about it, but uh, you know, you need, people need help. <laughs> You know, in order to generate appropriate fitness function based on their requirements. <coughs> the other example, the satellite domain. Uh, here, as I said, it's in orbit, in orbit testing of the onboard system, the last testing phase. Uh, there is, of course, a no, an overhead in, multi, in manipulating the devices on the satellite, the instruments, the antennas, and all that. Uh, it takes time. You, know, you have to move things around. Uh, there is a risk of hardware damage. There is uncertainties in terms of execution time. Uh, you never know how long it's going to take for a scenario to execute because it depends on the condition, the physical condition, the positions of things, the initial position, you know, and all that. Uh, but the problem here is that you have very tight time budgets to do that type of in orbit testing. Why? Because uh, you can only test a satellite whenever it's not too close to another satellite, whenever there is no risk of interference with another satellite. So you have very uh, limited time windows within which you can do that type of testing. So you cannot choose how much time you have for testing. <laughs> you know, you have to, you know. <coughs> so that's a specific uh, problem in the context of in-orbit uh, satellite system. And we worked on that with a satellite company, a leading satellite company called SES. Uh, and here the problem was to somehow find ways to optimize the testing, the order of test executions, to minimize the initialization and teardowns of test cases. And we actually use model checking for that. It uh, it's actually was a good application of model checking, which is usually not applicable in general, but which was very applicable in that context. Uh, we would make sure that whenever you executed test case one, it would fulfill the precondition of test case two, and test case two would fulfill the precondition of test case three. You know, so that's how we use them all checking. And then we use search again, multi-objective again, Bayesian simulation again, to prioritize test cases in order to prioritize two things. It was, sorry, two objectives. Minimize the chances of uh, hardware problems and make sure we tested critical functionalities first. In case we reached uh, the end of the time budget before we could finish uh, executing test cases. Yeah. So uh, prioritizing test cases, basically. So I just wanted to, those two things, I just wanted to briefly present them. I don't want to go into details. And the real reason why I presented all those projects is to come to those reflections and conclusions. But I wanted to do that based on concrete examples, not just uh, abstractions. So the first reflection is about the role of AI, of course. You know, we have done all those projects. I've done all those projects over the last 15 years. What do I conclude from this? Uh, that meta heuristic search is a very versatile and very useful technique in many contexts because most test automation problems can be expressed into search 
or stock optimi optimization problems without too much difficulty. Machine learning is very useful in order to make the guidance during the search more effective because it predicts where the search should go after a certain, after a certain number of observations uh, based on data such as test execution results, fault detections, and stuff like that. And natural language processing uh, helps alleviate the obstacle of having so much information in natural language such as requirements. Uh, for search, it's often a very practical uh, approach because it helps decrease, decrease modeling requirements. For example, often you don't need executable models. You just need enough information to compute the fitness values. So often it leads to much more reasonable modeling requirements, you know, because you don't need detailed operational executable models or whatever, you know. Or in the case of simulic models, those models already exist for other reasons. It's not models that have to be built uh, for enabling testing. It exists. It's part of the practice for other reasons. You know. uh, it helps also relax assumptions. We have seen when we did uh, schedulability analysis and stress testing that uh, we could relax assumptions when using search. We didn't need to. For example, one assumption of many of the schedulability analysis theorems is that all the tasks can start executing when the system starts. And that's considered to be the worst possible situation, which is not true in practice. Uh, search is very easy to parallelize. Like genetic algorithms is very easy to parallelize. You can massively parallelize those algorithms. Uh, and uh, nowadays, uh, you know, multi-core computers are a commodity. I mean, you know, it's not, uh, you know. For example, I have free access to such computers in my university. Um, the only problem is in techniques that are based on meta-heuristic search is that they, requires, they require expensive empirical studies because the only way you can demonstrate that it works is empirically, not analytically. So you need to run uh, massive empirical studies. And another problem is that, as we have seen, search is rarely sufficient by itself. In fact, in practice, depending on the problem, search has to be combined with other things. Machine learning, as we have seen, solvers, we have seen, for example, with uh, constraint programming, but I have other examples with SMT and statistical approaches. We, I haven't shown an example of that, but and of course, uh, system and environment modeling and simulation. So it's only by combining all those techniques together to solve a particular problem that you arrive at a scalable and practical solution. Okay. <laughs> Models are usually important, as we have seen, well, briefly. Usually, you need models of requirements or architecture, such as the task properties and dependencies, or the behavior of the system in the environment. You know, those models usually provide the information you require in order to compute the fittest function and guide the search. <coughs> so, <coughs> now, uh, those were more conclu technical conclusions that I've drawn from those many projects in collaboration with industry. But now I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, conclude on a, a few more philosophical slides about uh, software engineering and research. And so in practice, if you want to do research that is used, or that has a chance to be used, because of course there are other challenges that are not technical in the adoption of new techniques, which have nothing to do with the technical properties of a particular approach. But if we put that aside, if you want to have a chance for the result of your research to be used, you, in practice, need to strike a balance in terms of scalability, practicality, and applicability, and the maximum level of dependability guarantees. I mean, you, you have to choose uh, a solution that is balanced with respect to all those properties in a given context. Uh, we need to achieve that, we need more multidisciplinary research involving AI, but not only, as we have seen before. Uh, in any case, my observation is that in most contexts, even in contexts where people claim the contrary, like aerospace, uh, offering absolute guarantees is an illusion, because it's always based on assumptions that certain models are correct. You know, so, yeah. 
So uh, in, in, in the case, in the end, it's always about uh, performing risk analysis and reaching a certain degree of confidence. Uh, but the best trade-off, usually in a solution, is context-dependent. It's not. Uh, in the automotive industry, they work under very different constraints than the aerospace industry, than the oil industry, than the, you know. You have to find an even context. <laughs> what is the right balance? As I told you before, uh, in the automotive industry, they want to decrease the cost of hardware. In the satellite industry, it's not as much of a problem. They are not going to build uh, you know, 100 satellites even. You know, they're going to build a couple and send them. You know. So uh, they can make different trade-offs. You know. uh, so what that means is that very often, software engineering research cannot be performed outside of a well-defined context. You need to make working assumptions. And uh, it's very important that you, therefore, to the extent possible, in the context of your research, that you have a good understanding of the domain that is targeted by your research. There is no uh, universal solution to problems that is context independent that doesn't exist in software engineering. Sometimes people believe it because they've been working 20 years in the same environment, and they believe that that environment is a universe. But that's not true. I've worked with 35 companies, and there are techniques that work very well in certain contexts that fail miserably in other contexts. I mean, it's, uh, it's a very, that's what makes software engineering research both interesting and challenging. It's interesting because you don't have one testing problem. You have thousands of testing problems. But it's challenging because you really need to have, a, a, again, a sufficient understanding of the domain and the working assumptions. Uh, so that's why it's useful to work with. One of the reasons why it's useful to work with industry partners uh, because many academic papers, in my opinion, address problems that are unlikely to exist as defined. They make working assumptions that do not exist anywhere, uh, you know, or are unlikely to exist anywhere. Like, I don't know, test execution is free, or, you know, <laughs> so we can just run a lot of uh, test cases. <laughs> uh, or, you know, or people can. Uh, using some form of uh, you know, complicated logic defined precisely and correctly requirements by themselves alone in their office. You know. uh, well, it's not always true, you know, apart from that. Uh, and on the other hand, there are many zero problems that are long-standing that, have, that are insufficiently addressed by research. For example, the work I've told you about, about testing uh, controllers and with input signal and output signals. and uh, We worked on that in the last four or five years, but this is a long-standing problem. It, people have been using Simulink for 30 years. Huh? So how come we didn't have more papers on that before? You know, wh where does that come from? <laughs> it's not like the problem didn't exist in the last 30 years. You know. Uh, you know, you just have to talk to control engineers for two hours to find out about the problem, basically. You know. um, context factors and working assumptions have a huge impact, as I've said. So uh, that's uh, also something you, know, you can only understand if you work with engineers in an industrial context. Uh, scalability and practicality aspect, also in my opinion, are largely ignored by academic research. Often it's an afterthought. We do something. Soundness is a priority, and afterwards, we, and afterwards people try to consider how they could make the solution scalable or practical. But that's not possible. I mean, you, you, have, to, you have to keep those aspects in mind from the start of the research project. And what practical means is that it matches the working assumption in a given domain and context. And scalable, we know what that means. It cannot be an afterthought. You know. And uh, also something which is difficult, I find, in software engineering research is that what is a good solution is often a trade-off. But a trade-off is subjective. It's not an objective thing. <laughs> you know? So again, that's why you need to work with engineers, because you need to find out whether that trade-off is the right trade-off. You know, it's not a, an objective thing. Something is correct or is not correct. Or, you know. 
<coughs> it's a trade-off between many aspects, cost, reliability, accuracy, you know. So I, I've written some uh, slightly controversial pap papers, short papers about that, you know. Uh, like this one in actually software, or that one about uh, collaborative research with industry, with my former PhD supervisor, Vic Basili, who has been retired for a while. So that's my last paper with him. I decided that for his last paper would be with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. You know, uh, he has been retired for a while now. But uh, so, uh, and, uh, so to summarize, academic research needs industry to define proper problems, including proper working assumptions, an understanding of the domain, to account from or learn from engineering best practice. Those people are not stupid, huh? those engineers. They are clever people. They do many things right and intelligently, you know. You might as well learn from them, <laughs> you know. Uh, and to, prof of course, perform proper evaluations in realistic contexts. And industry benefits also from the collaboration with, I think, people like us. At least that's my experience. First, it helps mitigate the risk of innovation. Not all companies are like Google with infinite resources to do research. Many companies don't have the resources to do software engineering research. I mean, at least at a certain level. So uh, especially that a lot of non-software companies are developing software, and that's not their business to do software engineering research. They, you know, they are, they are automotive companies, satellite companies. I mean, they're not going to have a research, uh, software research department. I mean, it's not going to happen, you know. So uh, we are here to mitigate the risk of innovation, to explore potential solutions that, that may not work, you know. Of course, it's just for them to keep up to date with latest ideas and results. Often, those people are not reading conference proceedings or scientific journals. And of course, to train highly qualified engineers and scientists. As we know, uh, everybody has difficulties hiring people who are adequate for the job. Well, when you collaborate with a company for, let's say, four years, at the end, the student knows the domain, it knows the company. Uh, you know, he's fully trained, he, you know. In fact, the student or the postdoc becomes the main technology transfer instrument you know, <laughs> to the company. But of course, there are challenges in such collaboration, which I'm not going to discuss into details. One is commitment. You need to make sure that there is commitment on both sides over a period of time. Usually, in my case, I don't do projects below four years, because in our context, four years is the time duration of a PhD ask commitments for four years, you know. Uh, but the problem is that there is a big difference in time horizons on the industry and academic side. You know, for them, you know, four years is, is infinity. Or <laughs> <it's not laughs> you know, but, you know. <laughs> so it's a bit complicated. So you, what you need to do is to organize your projects so that you have intermediary deliverables. Basically, the goal is to create a win-win situation where they feel the benefit along the project. You cannot tell them, I will deliver something in four years. I mean, no. you, know, you need to have a, a constant interaction from the beginning somehow. You know, so you have to resolve that. And maybe more than anything else, IP is often very complex, uh, intellectual property. So here, in our case, we are lucky in our center to have lawyers who help us with that and we negotiate. Because I cannot do that. I have no idea I mean, how to do that. So usually you need the support for that. You need people who can negotiate with the companies so that, uh, you know, eventually if something great comes out of the project, you also benefit a bit from it. You know, it's not just. In our case, especially in our case, that what we do, one strategy that we have in our partnerships is that we share the cost of the project. So they are not clients, they are partners. We share the cost. We have mechanisms to do that. Uh, and therefore, if we share the cost of the project, uh, we should share the IP, you know, somehow, you know. All right. So, anyway, I'll make the slides available. There are references, uh, and I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>